Hello friends and welcome to another video. So, since you've maybe seen my um, digital trap videos, I've since discovered a lot of, done a lot of research and started uh, also modifying CD players, all the CD players. And generally found out also from people on forums that have been uh, manufacturers, uh, top designers in audio that have been commenting about things that matter in digital and also looked at a bit of history and you know, s separating what's what. Does a 32-bit DAC actually output 32-bit DAC or is it just marketing fluff? And how much have we progressed over the years? So now these are the, some of the CD players that I bought. And one of the things I discovered is that probably these two are my more my favorites to listen to uh, at the moment, even compared to a lot of much more higher spec DACs. And this is before I even modified it. When I modified this one, it improved a lot, but it's just not my kind of thing but um, and I will still do that and also start building my own deck but what I found I want to just share with you Len, and let's just sort of see what kind of bullshit we feel, feel and general things that are just influenced by marketing but uh, but we have to see what actually comes out of modern decks and how that compares with the older decks so we, and for example PS, PCM versus DSD and their advantages and disadvantages and what happens when you transfer the two to each other. So we'll talk about all of those topics in this video. Uh, it will be probably a bit on the long side but um, bear with me. Um, you might find this interesting in, in um, separating the wheat from the chaff in the digital domain. So let's get started. Eight things. First of thing that I found out, even now modifying CD players myself, that implementation matters a lot. So the power supplies, the analog stages, the op amps, capacitors, even the PCB design, how the ground has been, is digital ground separate from analog ground. There's all kinds of things that matter a lot about how your deck sounds. And earlier CD players, it was much more difficult to come up with a good design. And so, um, and just like with modern decks, the implementation matters how it sounds. But at the early stages, there were also designers that were um, not so competent and they screwed it up. And so what happened as well is that deck manufacturers, to prevent that, actually moved all the functions inside a single chip so that the, the, the processing of data, the timing of the CD player, maybe even if it's a CD player or a deck, the, the digital filtering, the oversampling and the op amps, all are in a single chip so you can't screw it up um, because that used to that, that did happen and um, so that's one thing to know implementation matters is not, not just the deck chip that is my findings um, even though there's of course family traits when you hear two with the same deck in it there's of course um, things that sound the same um, but it's not but it's far removed from what some people think it's just digital it's all the same it should sound the same well it, it, it is so clear to everybody that if, if you're discussing you you're if you're still doubting that you're, you're on the wrong channel i would highly suggest that you would sort of move on from here um so accurate clocks so just if you to understand the digital signal um just quickly here um just so we're all on the same page. So what is very important if we look at the um, PCM, so most streaming services and uh, CDs and uh, uh, digital files, they'll all look something like this. What we have is to recreate a beautiful uh, uh, music signal. This is just a sine wave, a music signal is very complex. But what we do is we mesh every so often at a very regular interval. So for CD, this used to be 44,000 times per second. Um, we measure how high this level and the CD format had 65,000 levels. So they, we had a really nice fine gradation um, to measuring the, 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 the signal level. And when, when we then re reconstruct it, we would actually sort of approximate this um, nice sine wave. And that's how it works, right? But equally important is the timing between this, because as you can see, that's usually forgotten. They said, you know, digital is just zeros and ones, and those zeros and ones describe the length of this thing. But what we also need is this, because if some data delays is delayed too much, you can see that this waveform here would actually sort of start flattening out. And then if this one came earlier, it would, so it would create a, a, a bent signal. 
So huge distortion would occur, and that is called the timing variation, which is called jitter. Now, what a lot of people don't um, forget is that the early CD players had a chip in it that would control the spinning of the disc, and that so that the DAC, the clock for the DAC, uh, in the rate in which it would produce samples would be constant, and it would the servo chip would help that the CD spin at such a rate that it exactly matched that clock, and that would keep the timing really um, tight. Now, if we split a transport from a DAC, what happened next is of course that the, the DAC can no longer control the transport because it doesn't have information going there. So what happens then is that the transport becomes the master, sends the signal to, uh, the, 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 to the DAC, and then the DAC has to follow the master. So if then, for example, the signals are a bit, for, uh, for example, if, uh, if um, you use a format in which we uh, see the timing because, some t for example, the signal rises, then if the signal rises a bit too slow, the timing gets a bit off um, or even a bit of noise on the line. So that is called jitter. It would happen with SPDIF and then um, you could add some very clever logic in your in your deck to, to deal with that and to sort of subtly change your timing so it could deal with those variations that came up. And the, and the same happened when you started with your first DAX that would plug into your PC because the first USB standards, the DAC couldn't do couldn't just sit there and was dependent on the computer or your Android or your iPhone to sending it information at the right pace. It would dictate the pace. So if your computer had or your phone had something else to do and it didn't get to giving you a sample, the sample would arrive too late. It was not until DAC USB class 2 that we actually had a standard in which the USB, we can task it to saying, hey computer, give me more data now. Give me more data now. And that actually enabled the modern DACs, the really modern DACs, to implement the clock again at the DAC, run in exactly the right rate that it needs to run and, and make sure it has enough of a buffer to just keep requesting data from the computer and the computer becomes the slave. So the, the, the DAC again is in control of the data stream. Now, one thing is to notice that if you go to DACs that use a very high sample rate, and especially this happens with DSD, the, the more samples you take per second, so have a look at that graph again, so in DSD we take a lot of samples, we'll get into that a little bit later, we take shit, you know, shit loads of samples um, because we don't have too much level information in, in DSD. But you can see that here, we, we, if we get a small delay, here it doesn't matter, but if we have lots of samples being put to the output, we have to be far more accurate because we, we, the, the, the time domain has gotten very small compared to here. So the higher your sample rate is, the more the jitter gets an influence on the sound. Because there's a lot more information and it's much more time critical. And for example, non-oversampling decks which work at lower speeds that don't have the higher speeds, they're naturally more immune to timing variations because they, they, they go at a, at a much slower pace. Um, another thing, so now we'll jump a bit, we were jumping across a little bit, but in the early days, when you had a CD player and it said it was a 16-bit uh, um, um, CD player, what you, if you looked inside the DAC, it was actually a 16-bit DAC, or when it said it was an 18-bit DAC, it was usually an 18-bit DAC. So it was, you had this reference of to what was being done uh, inside. However, I can tell you now that if you have a 32-bit DAC, that DAC will that is has nothing to do with how it functions inside. So it might have 32-bit digital filters, but there's certainly not 32 bits on the output. So what it, instead it is in, with modern decks, if you see 24-bit, 32-bit, it is the data, the type of data that the deck accepts. It has nothing to do with how it functions. Nothing, completely nothing. No deck chip has 32 bits of outputs levels at its output, none whatsoever, not even close. And we'll get into some of those calculations. Um, so that's that. Now, another thing that a lot of people don't understand 
is that digital filters and noise shapers always lose timing and or level information. And PCM format excels in signal levels and DSD in timing accuracy. When you convert the both of them, bad news. So let's get into that. Um, how are we going? Yes, so we have PCM. So what we have here is a very granular um, way. So, um, so if you look at this with, with noise shaping, with filters, so what we need to realize here is that, as you can see, we have taken samples, but there's a whole gap between that and the signal runs like this. So one of the approaches that we can do is do oversampling and say, you know what, we will fill in the gaps between these two samples so that we reconstitute the lab and we don't end up with a staircase type of signal. Now you don't always end up with a staircase sample. I can show you a deck that doesn't do any oversampling and yet you can see it is actually pretty smooth. Um, despite this uses no oversampling and yet you can see we don't have the staircase effect. So um, yes, it looks a bit odd, but this is a 20 kilohertz signal on a very old deck, one of those first decks, and it's actually pretty smooth. Um, but let's get back to here. So when we smooth this out and we apply some kind of filter or a shaper to, to, to give us this nice sine wave that looks good, but one thing that most people don't realize that when once you have the new signal that you've created and it looks all nice and smooth, can you actually re run back and re-establish the original information because if you can't reconstitute the original you've actually lost information that is pretty clear right you had the info 16 bits information with 65,000 levels now you apply a filter you will have lost some information for example if you have a multi-point filter that tries to determine the point here or even there but it also uses the input here 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 and here to to establish what this should be to make it all nice and smooth it will come out somewhere different than this point because these points from other time periods actually influence this point of the signal which is weird like this how can something that appears three seconds later uh, or not three seconds I mean I'm exaggerating I'm gonna say a point, you know a fraction of a second later that hasn't even occurred in already influences the signal level there it's so there's a time smearing and that level can never be reconstituted un unless you had a linear filter and you can just, you know, or you knew that it was a second. But as soon as you can't reconstitute the original samples that were given to you, you've lost information. So all noise shapers and all filters, that's why it's called a filter, it filters things out. You lose information. So never forget. Now, that is not to say that you you may like that result. Um, so that is up to you. Some people like the original music result. Some like the, 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 the new signal that was created by a noise shaper or by a, a filter. So that is a personal preference, but don't think that you gained anything. Like if you want to stick, if you, you have lost information. You still might like to sound better. That's fine. But we've lost, lost information. So never forget that. Um, how much? That's debatable. But I've seen uh, estimations as to one or two bits resolution can easily be lost to a digital fail filter, so which sounds very reasonable. Um, oh yeah, and then the other thing. So um, if we look at this, so what you can see is I already told you. So this format, especially when it was recorded in DSD format, is superior because rather than having it, it, so this DSD format only has on off. So here we had 65,000 levels. Here we only have one bit. So we have on and off and we need to very cleverly switch it on and off to recon and use filters to make this um, the same signal as, as you clearly see here, um, which can be done. Um, you no, know, lots of people even like this process. But what I'm saying is that this format has inherently far more time resolution where this has far more level information. We'll get into the real formulas of that, how that looks like. But um, if it was recorded like this, you had much critical uh, time information. And because our hearing is pretty sensitive to when the signal goes through zero, um, you know, that's why you have class A amplifiers as well. 
um, this could be superior in the end, but um, you do need enough samples to 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 have the equivalent of the number of levels that we have because we only have one level and we have 65,000 levels here or so even 16 million level if it was was a 24 bit real um, stream. So when we move between these formats, so if you record it like this and you then to uh, if a sound engineer converted it to PCM and then back. So when you go this way, you lose the timing information because that isn't present here. And when you move this way, you move the level information. So that is a really bad process. And I think that's why I see comments from people that have really good gear that say that when it is a true DSD stream and it wasn't ever in PCM, it sounds really good. The problem is, is of course, that most of our digital music and all our streaming services are in PCM format. So um, you, you will lose something from going this way. How much? That's what we will talk about now. And uh, let's go to that. Here we go. So. If we look at the very old chip from 1985, it had those 65,000 levels at three, and it could do 384 hertz, so 384 kilohertz sam sampling rate. That was what it was capable for. If you now look at the best that we have now on DSD, DSD 1024, it has two levels on and off at 45 megahertz. So this means if we compare it to this sampling rate, it can do 118 on offs in the same time as this 35 year, 38, 40 year old chip could do 65,000 levels. So this is a little bit, this is a lot less than that in the same time span. However, because of those clever dithering techniques, it can give you the impression, but it actually has less levels of available to it. And I said the format itself, when you are really in DSD format, you, um, and this is just on a theoretical level. So the sound influence is, it, it, I can't be definitive about that. Um, you also have some new decks that actually use five bits. So they start improving on this DSD. So they use the same techniques with dithering, but they have 32 levels. So they have a five bit um, chip doing the levels. And I think some modern ASS also use something similar. So they, they, they're trying to bridge the gap, the, the deficiencies that are sort of present here with these levels to borrow some of these techniques make it a little bit multi-bit to, to have that fine-grained response, especially with apparently with loud uh, noise levels, you need it. And um, by the way, one of the earliest bitstream um, chips, the TDA1549 also had that, that was a five-bit chip, um, even though they called it bitstream. Um, then I want to just have a look at the noise floor. So before we get into anything else, but we probably will do that in section two of this video. We're gonna break it apart here. And in section two, we'll get into this. So see you on the other side. Thank you for watching so this far. And I hope to catch you in part B when we're going to look at the noise floor and at the actual output of bits by modern decks and by old decks. So we're gonna compare that and um, we'll discuss that a bit. So yes. All right, see you on the other side. Have a good day. Bye-bye.